This is blowing my mind. A freshly published study demonstrated a whopping 28.7% weight loss over a 68-week time period from a drug called retitrutide. Plus, it brought profound relief from pain caused by knee arthritis. But the very first thought that should go off in our minds is what's the downside? So let's have a look at the results and see how this new treatment compares to what's already on the market. So retitrutide is a complex drug. It's a triple agonist. But what does that mean? And is it safe? Well, it means that it contains three classes of agonists. So the first is glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1. So we know a lot about that peptide, and the most famous drug that only contains that peptide is Ozempic. But GLP-1 medications have been used in clinical medicine to treat type 2 diabetes since 2005. And the big innovation with GLP-1 medications was figuring out how to stop GLP-1 from being broken down so quickly, because GLP-1 is naturally broken down within minutes. Which, by the way, is why supplements claiming to increase GLP-1, they're a waste of money. But then, researchers found a promising lead in an unusual place, the mouth of the Gila monster. So in its venom, they found a structurally similar chemical that resisted breakdown, and it binds to the same receptors in the body that GLP-1 does. And in the years following, the technology improved. We went from twice daily injections to once weekly doses. And along the way, we discovered something else. GLP-1 medications, they don't just help to control type 2 diabetes. Those who took GLP-1 medications, they shed weight rapidly as well. And the mechanism here is complex. GLP-1 medications, they do more than just stimulating insulin release. They also act on receptors in the brain that help us feel fuller for longer and feel satisfied after eating and suppress our appetite. Further, they slow down digestion and again make us feel fuller for longer. They even seem to hack the brain's reward pathways, reducing our tendency to eat for pleasure rather than just from hunger. So with the incredible successes of GLP-1 medications, scientists they started to look for additional ways to tweak the natural processes to change how our bodies respond to eating. So what else could be added to GLP-1 medications to achieve even greater weight loss? So here is where the second agonist comes in. Gastric Inhibitory Polypeptide, or GIP. So remember, retitrutide has three classes of agonists, but GLP-1 and GIP, that combination, is what's found in a medication called tazepatide. So like GLP-1, GIP, it also stimulates the body to release insulin when we eat. So tazepatide, in the trials that we've got so far, it appears to offer even greater weight loss compared to just GLP-1 medications such as Azempic. It seems that by taking advantage of multiple pathways, it ramps up the weight loss effect and the appetite suppressant effects. So retitrutide, it takes that evolution one step further. It adds a new target to GLP-1 and GIP, and that is glucagon receptors. So we've known for a while that glucagon, it stimulates to the liver to release stored glucose and to produce new glucose as well, and that raises is blood sugar. Now, that isn't exactly what we want to do when we're treating type 2 diabetes, which is what the medications that we've been talking about were initially developed for. But glucagon has got some attractive effects. So it boosts energy expenditure and it also stimulates the breakdown of stored fat and prevents new fat formation. So these are features that potentially could magnify the weight loss effects that we've seen with medications such as Azempic and Tazepatide. But there's still the problem of raising glucose levels. But that's where the combination of GLP-1 GIP and the glucagon receptors all mix in because maybe we could reap the benefits of that glucagon pathway without raising blood sugar if we mix everything together. So that is the promise of a three-pronged approach that packs that powerful punch for weight loss. So again, that's the theory, but does it work in practice and is it safe? Well, early results were promising. Retitrutide, it seemed to work as expected, but the results just published are from a phase three trial. So this involves a larger group of participants and it gives us far more robust data about the effectiveness and safety of this new medication. So the trial investigated the effects of two doses of retitrutide in 440 overweight or obese adults. Participants also had knee arthritis and they didn't have existing diabetes. So they took retitrutide or a placebo for 68 weeks. So what did the results look like over that time period? Well first, let's consider the weight loss. Those who took retitrutide at the higher dose, they lost an average of 28.7% of their body weight from baseline. For the average participant, that amounted to a staggering 32 kilograms or 71 pounds. And at the smaller dose, the weight loss was almost just as great at 26.4%. The placebo group here, they only lost 2.1% of their body mass. 
Then there's the pain reduction with their knee arthritis. They measured pain levels using the WOMAC index pain score. With both doses of retrotrutide, the pain levels fell by around 75%, which is incredible. But the placebo group's pain, that fell by about 40.3%, which shows that placebo effect, but still the retrotrutide effect is far greater compared to the placebo effect. So the weight loss numbers and the pain reduction that they bought, they sound significantly impressive. But how do they compare to other medications like Ozempic and Tazepatide? Well, there was a similar trial of Ozempic, and it lasted about a year and four months, and it involves participants who were overweight or obese without diabetes. Those who took Ozempic, they lost about 15% of their weight. But what about Tazepatide? So recall that that medication, it targets two receptors. It targets GLP-1 and GIP. So in a phase three study that involved about 2,500 adults who were overweight or obese but without diabetes, it tested three different weekly doses of tazepatide against a placebo for about a year and a half. And the participants at the highest dose, they lost an average of 21% of their body mass. So these medications seem to be getting better and more powerful, and retrotrutide, on the surface at least, it seems to set a new bar for weight loss. But the headline numbers, while they are eye-catching, when we dig into the details, we see a few reasons for caution. So one thing that sticks out, for instance, is the higher rate of patients stopping the treatment. So it hit over 18% at the larger dose. That compares to only 4% with the placebo. To put that in perspective, the discontinuation rate was 4.5% in the trial of Ozempic, and it hit just over 7% in the trial of Tazepatide. So against that background, 18% looks extraordinarily high. Now, in fairness, the authors of the retrotrutide study, they try and address this. So they note that the tendency to discontinue the treatment was linked to baseline body mass index. So those who started at the lower body mass index, they were more likely to drop out. So in essence, they stopped because they lost too much weight. And when they look at those with a higher baseline body mass index of 35 and above, the discontinuation rate, it was a more modest 12.1% at the higher dose. But that's still a lot higher than the numbers seen with Ozempic and Tazepatide. And besides losing too much weight, the discontinuation was likely due to adverse effects. So the weight loss medications, they all share some common side effects like nausea and diarrhea. So do those seem any worse with retrotrutide? Well, let's take a look at one example. We'll have a look at diarrhea. With the two doses of retrotrutide, it was reported by 35% and 33% of participants. With the placebo, it was only 13.4%. And in the semaglutide study, 31.5% who took the medication did report some diarrhea. With tazepatide, 23% reported diarrhea at the highest dose. So the usual side effects generally follow this pattern. The levels are fairly similar between Ozempic and Retrotrutide, but on the other hand, the percentage reporting common side effects tends to be significantly lower for Tazepatide, and this raises an important question. Is the additional benefit of Retrotrutide compared to Tazepatide strong enough to outweigh the greater side effect burden? So we'll come back to that question in a moment. But there's a worrying side effect that does show up with Retrotrutide that isn't standard when having a look at Ozempic or Tazepatide. The side effect is dysesthesia. It's a condition where we experience pain, itching and tingling, among other unpleasant sensations when our skin is touched. Now, this isn't unknown with Ozempic or Tazepatide. It's just very uncommon. So in the two studies of Tazepatide, for instance, 0.4% of participants reported that side effect. But in this new Retrotrutide study, almost 21% of those at the highest doses reported dysesthesia. And the figure was 0.7% with placebo. So although the researchers report that the symptoms were generally mild, this still raises an important red flag that warrants further investigation. Another thing worth noting here is that these are preliminary results that don't give us a lot of detail. So we don't see the data on all potential side effects. But in a phase two study of retrotrutide, there was evidence of elevated heart rates and heart rhythm problems. So we'll have to see whether researchers have noticed similar patterns in this larger phase three trial. So with these potential side effects in mind, let's return to the question that I posed a moment ago. The side effects seem to be more pronounced with retrotrutide. So do we get extra benefit with retrotrutide that outweighs that added cost? Well, the headline numbers, as we saw, they are striking. At the highest dose, we see a weight loss of about 29% with retrotrutide. Compared to those who took Tazepatide at the highest dose, they had an average weight loss of 21%, and that trial lasted one month longer than the Retrotrutide study. So it appears to be 29% versus 21%. Well, actually, those numbers are a bit like apples and oranges, so let me explain why. In trials like this, 
The researchers, they usually try and assess the effectiveness of an intervention from two slightly different angles. So on one hand, they measure the average impact by including everyone who began the study. This is called a treatment regimen estimate or an intention to treat analysis. On the other hand, they also try and estimate what the effects would be if everyone followed the study protocol procedure exactly. So this is called an efficacy estimate or a per protocol analysis. So clearly the numbers are going to be better in the second case because not everyone actually follows the study procedures. But the treatment regimen estimate, it gives us a more realistic gauge of real world impact across a group of typical patients. And that's the analysis that's usually used as a primary outcome of a study. But there's something unusual about the numbers reported for the Retitrutide study. So let's have a look again at the table of results. It's labeled efficacy estimate results. So what this means is that the numbers are estimating Retitrutide's impact if everyone followed the study protocol. But if we have a look at the treatment regimen estimate for Retitrutide, it's 20 23.7% at the highest dose. So there's actually very little difference here between what the treatment regimen estimate of 20.9% with retrotrutide is. So overall, here's my take at the moment. I want to wait for the publication of the full study to have a look at the adverse effects. It's possible that there is a greater burden of side effects that doesn't outweigh the additional effectiveness of retrotrutide. So I'll say that again to emphasize this point. It's possible that there is a greater burden of side effects that does not outweigh the additional effectiveness. The intention to treat analysis showed a 23.7% weight loss at the highest dose of retrotrutide, and that isn't much more compared to zepatide, which is 20.9%, but there does seem to be a significantly worse side effect profile, at least with these preliminary results. So overall, if a person wasn't quite reaching their weight loss goals with tazepatide, retitrutide might be an option. But until we've got more safety data, I would not reach for it as a first-line option over tazepatide. And if you're considering pursuing these medications like azimpic, tazepatide, or retitrutide, there's some crucial information that you really need to know that many of my patients aren't told. So make sure to check out this next video here to get the full picture.